Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Yuka Hoyi. In this week's show, he was a towering figure in Japanese entertainment and continues to be revered after his death. Johnny Kitagawa, who died in 2019 at the age of 87, was the architect of the country's vastly successful boy band empire, and his company, Johnny and Associates, still dominates the lucrative J pop market. Yet allegations of child abuse and sexual exploitation surrounded the music mogul for decades and even documented in a court case. They've recently resurfaced, but media reaction has been perfunctory at best. Our correspondents re report on what's behind the virtual silence. It's the dark side of J pop. This young man is one of the few survivors of Johnny Kitagawa's alleged sexual abuse to have gone public about their experiences. Johnny started to massage my feet. He took off my underwear and touched my genitals. He then performed oral sex on me. Kawan Okamoto is a Japanese Brazilian artist who began his career at Kitagawa's agency, the pinnacle of Japan's huge pop industry. He says it's time he and other survivors spoke out. As a producer, Kitagawa hand picked young boys hoping to achieve J pop stardom. A rare chance to realize their dreams. TV networks that rely on a supply of Johnny's talent decided to ignore the allegations about Kitagawa, something this journalist finds frustrating. In the late 1990s, the magazine he worked for published articles in which former pop hopefuls claimed they'd been sexually abused by Kitagawa. They said those who had fallen out of favor with the producer had little chance of staying in the business. <laughs> To think there may be victims who did not become stars and who have to live with memories of being sexually abused makes me feel really bad. Kitagawa filed a defamation suit against the magazine. The first verdict went his way, but it was partially reversed on appeal by a higher court that found that the allegations against him were reasonable. Some of the boys would wear two pairs of jeans to avoid being sexually assaulted. If the public had been more aware, we could have prevented this. Johnny Kitagawa was never charged with a crime. Recent allegations have suggested that the abuse continued for two decades after the court ruling. As Japan digested the allegations against Kitagawa, these fans flocked to a venue in Tokyo to listen to their idols. We come to concerts because we like the group and want to see them live. I never felt like I was giving money directly to Johnny's agency, to be honest. I would have wanted the media to talk more about this issue. There are articles on the internet, but Japanese TV channels don't mention it at all. Johnny and Associates is still a powerful presence in Japanese entertainment. But the wall of silence about its founder's alleged sexual abuse has come tumbling down. France 24's James Mulholland joins me in the studio. Hi there, James. Hi, Yuka. Now, James, what's staggering about this scandal is that alleged sexual abuse at the hands of Johnny Kitagawa went on for years after a court ruled that allegations made against him were indeed credible. So, why is it so difficult in Japan for victims of sex crime to seek justice? Staggering really is the word here, Yuka. Here's why. Up until 2017, Japan's sex crime laws hadn't been updated or amended for over a century. And we should mention first up that for women in Japan, the situation remains very difficult to press charges for sexual assault. For example, only around half of the accused perpetrators who are arrested in Japan ever go to trial. And women frequently complain of being treated、uh, with disdain by police officers and,、uh, and told not to press charges. So, kind of victim shaming. Exactly. Also, on top of this, in the same line, many cases are dropped because the acts allegedly committed don't fall into any specific category of criminal o f f e n s e So, it really is letter of the law stuff here. And what could play a part in the,、uh, in the uh, Johnny's Jr.'s case is that prior to 2017, due to Japan's criminal code, men could not. Legally be,、uh, be qualified as victims of rape. Only women could, due to some very specific wording. Since then, the crime of rape, as it's defined, has been changed to the crime of forcible sexual intercourse, which means men can now be recognized as victims. So we've seen something of a step forward. After over a century, there are signs that the culture of shame and silence around sexual assault are slowly changing, even if 
campaigners uh, say too slowly? As we saw in that report, it was the decision by former teen idol Kawan Okamoto to go public with his story that helped expose the elephant in the room. He joins us now from Tokyo. Kawan, thank you for speaking to us and for your courage to speak out. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. How did you get into the entertainment industry? Both my parents are Brazilian. Japanese-Brazilian. So when I was about 14 or 15 and started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, I looked for ways to turn my fortunes around, being the son of Brazilian migrant workers. And since music had always helped me cope with things, I wanted to make our lives better through music and give my parents an opportunity to enjoy life both in Japan and in Brazil. That's how I got into the music industry. What was it like, what was the training like as a young backup dancer at Johnny Jr., as they're called? Johnny's Juniors are a very select group. Thousands send their CVs to the agency every month, out of which hundreds are called for auditions. Out of those hundreds, only a handful are accepted. There could be just one, or sometimes none at all. And even after they've reached that stage and joined the juniors, there are hundreds of members already in the talent pool. Only about five of them would actually make a debut, so the chances are really limited. And what was it like working with Johnny Kitagawa? What kind of relationship did he have with other young performers? Johnny-san was very down-to-earth and wanted to be seen as a friend. He would pop in to see rehearsals and live shows, but was usually very discreet. He was just like a man next door. Everyone loved him, basically. Now, you've spoken out about being sexually abused by Johnny Kitagawa. Uh, I know it's difficult. Could you tell us what happened? The first time it happened, I didn't understand what was going on. I couldn't react. I couldn't make sense of it. I thought he was giving me a massage, and then suddenly his hands went towards my genitals and sexual abuse ensued. Because I didn't understand what was happening, I couldn't push back or say no, nor could I accept it. So I pretended to be asleep. That seemed like the best option. You've said that you believe 100 to 200 boys could have been abused during the four years that you were with at Johnny and Associates. Did you ever discuss the issue with other boys and perhaps consider taking some kind of action? Mm, well, we didn't talk with each other about what was happening. We generally avoided the subject. I think everyone reacted differently. There were those who refused his advances, but there were also those who voluntarily offered themselves up to him. Some left the group because of the abuse. As for myself, there was a police station right outside and I once thought about going there. But I thought, what if the police buries the story? Or if they didn't bury the story, what would happen if Johnny San's abuse was proven and became public? I would be unable to continue with my career if I made an enemy of Johnny and Associates, or Johnny San could be arrested and the agency could be shut down. If I couldn't prove what happened, I might end up being called a liar. I could be left both being sexually abused and labelled a liar. All those prospects seemed really scary. Mr Kitagawa was involved in every stage of the recruitment and management process, leaving young talent entirely at his mercy. What could be done to prevent this sort of abuse of power from happening again, do you think? What we can do to prevent this happening, in the case of Johnny and Associates, the man himself is no longer around. But this kind of thing, not just sexual abuse, but other problems, has been happening because the media have turned a blind eye. 
and because people use their power to crush the dreams of aspiring talent, unless they go through that kind of experience, that's a really bad thing. I think it's important for everyone to think of the problem as their own and not say that they don't know anything about sexual abuse. Everyone needs to reflect on themselves and ask if they aren't just going with the tide without caring about these things. If they can really protect what really matters to them by doing so, I hope to see a society where each and everyone can freely say what they want and what they don't want. Kawan Okamoto, thank you once again for sharing your experience and thought with us. Thank you. James, the talent agency Johnny and Associates hasn't publicly responded to the recent allegations yet, has it? After Okamoto's press conference, uh, the agency released a statement saying that since Johnny Kitagawa's death in 2019, the company has worked to be more in line with the times in order to gain confidence, the confidence of the public. It said its utmost priority was to adapt to the changing environment by establishing transparency in its organisational structure and policies in a manner that evokes social trust. Now, it didn't make any specific reference to Okamoto's allegations, but reports indicate that the firm did contact its business partners to say that it was taking the accusations seriously. Johnny & Associates is a notoriously secretive company, but it did contact France 24 to confirm that it had indeed been in touch with its partners. It declined to comment on the, uh, the content, but said that it would release uh, a detailed report. Now, it's worth pointing out that after those uh, abuse allegations that we heard about against Kitagawa in the 1990s, they were ignored by Japan's mainstream media. So Kawan Okamoto, of course, went to the Tokyo Foreign Correspondents Club in order to make sure it made international headlines. Obviously, it has. And along with that, it's brought comparisons to other high-profile uh, sex abuse cases involving influential, powerful celebrities, the likes of Michael Jackson or British uh, media personality uh, Jimmy Savile. Not just in Japan, but all over the world. Well, James Mulholland, thank you once again for your insight. That's it for this edition of Access Asia. Do stay tuned for more world news here on France 24.